Hi everybody, um, you're very welcome. Uh, my name is Joan Mulvihill and I am your session. We decided on the word facilitator instead of moderator. Yes, yeah, so I am the facilitator for today's discussion. I'm very delighted to be back working with the IBI again in 2021. We did a stellar lineup of events webinar series last year, and I have no doubt that this year is going to be just as successful. So thank you all of you for joining us. I see we have 53 participants already, and uh, we have a great lineup for you today, probably one of our most densely packed lineups, um, and I think really reflective of just the breadth um, of businesses that have so much to share on, on this really juicy topic, which is how we are accelerating SMEs through digital transformation and competitiveness and all of that through the, the spirit of uh, collaboration. Um, and I think collaboration is a really important point on all of this. I noticed the slides are plowing on, so I should actually just, okay. I don't know what's going on. Okay, I'm not controlling the slides, but um, I'm going to just quickly take you through our lineup for today, how it's going to work. So this is me doing the opening uh, proceedings and introducing the event introduced. Um, we're going to start with uh, Mark, Professor Marcus Halford from NUI Maynooth for some opening remarks, really to welcome you uh, from an IVI NUI Maynooth perspective um, and to get us the ball rolling on 2021. And followed by um, our first speaker, each of our speakers has 10 minutes. There's um, six, seven speakers. Um, so Willem Unker is the professor in EIIT, which is the European Institute for Innovation and Technology, followed by my old friend Enda Keen from Tree Metrics, one of my fave businesses, dying to know what he's been up to next. Um, Mr. Greg Chu of QPQ, um, Matt McCann, Access Earth, um, John Murat from Talent Cloud, uh, Louis Ryan, Ash Technologies, and finally, um, Alan Darcy from Anim Technologies. So as you can see, a really broad range, everything there from, you know, recruitment challenges, um, uh, people who are literally saving the planet, um, dealing with issues around accessibility, um, telecommunications, the whole lot. So really a broad mix of SMEs um, in Ireland using technology, innovation, um, and working collaboratively, collaborating very strongly with, with the IVI and Maynooth and really showcasing, I suppose, their important role in supporting businesses in the Midwest region. So. Um, when they've all finished speaking and doing their 10 minutes, um, I am going to moderate, facilitate some Q&A. By all means, please pop your questions um, into the Q&A and I will get through those. And if you're being shy, I will no doubt be making copious notes and coming up with questions myself. So uh, don't let me have all the fun. Do put in your Q's and A's there. And then at the very end, Marcus um, Helfert will come back for just some concluding remarks and wrap up. And I'll just take you through the next event that is planned for March the 4th, but more about that later. Without further ado, I am going to hand you over to Marcus right now to get the ball rolling. So thank you very much. Thanks, Joan. And yeah, so my name is Marcus Helford. I'm the director of the Innovation Value Institute. So I, I say just a few um, uh, sentences uh, around um, uh, why we have this webinar. So it's uh, one of the uh, events in uh, in a series uh, of webinars. But this one, I'm particularly delighted to have such a lineup of speakers, expertise of different uh, aspects of SME, but also in the European uh, context. So I, I'm really looking forward uh, to the presentations around it. And it's all about um, helping SMEs to accelerate and supporting SMEs and companies uh, along that digital transformation. As you probably all know, it's uh, like it offers a lot of opportunities, digital technologies, but it's not an easy journey. And I think collaboration, partnerships, working together uh, to address these challenges and uh, bringing uh, companies and the whole ecosystem systems forward. Uh, this is what we are in the Innovation Value Institute setting out to do with our partners together, of course, uh, and helping SMEs uh, around this. And that's also the, the aim and the spirit of this uh, webinar to share some experiences, expertise, and uh, hopefully uh, uh, helping you to at least get some pointers what to do and, and what can be done, and also showcasing uh, some of the successful ongoing journeys uh, around uh, transformation. 
Um, so we are not alone um, within that uh, transformation. So we have built uh, a, a network uh, of partners, for example, uh, Merit, the Middle Eastern regional innovation um, uh, space around that, but also, for example, uh, Kildare uh, County Chambers, also academic partners, also organizations on regional development. So um, in, in that slide, so we have some examples of our partners uh, around uh, Manuf University, around the Innovation Value Institute, which we work together in with companies, academic partners, um, uh, training partners around to really help SMEs uh, along that uh, transformation um, challenge. So, and if we go to the next slide, um, uh, of course, um, uh, helping, working and collaborating is not an easy um, uh, undertaking. And what we have done is in that spirit of collaboration and engagement process. So we are basically discussion, innovation workshops, and then some research and looking at uh, what are the, the priorities uh, to help and what are the challenges around this. Uh, and then building roadmaps. So we basically, with our partners together at the Innovation Value Institute, we try to shape roadmaps, tailored roadmaps for, for organizations. And I know some of the speakers today, uh, we work together already on some parts of that uh, journey, uh, helping uh, to, to, to prioritize and roadmapping that. And uh, so hopefully during the day, during this, uh, the, this webinar, um, we will provide some or see some insights into this as well. But as just as a starting point, for example, we have uh, an innovation or an assessment tool. There's a link on, on that slide. So if you are interested in, in starting and looking at uh, prioritizing some aspects on it, benchmarking is, uh, so I, I invite you uh, to, to conduct that, that it's an online uh, questionnaire, the assessment tool to start maybe the journey of digital transformation. Uh, and then um, if you are interested, of course, uh, contact us or partners, and we can uh, hopefully find a way of uh, working together, roadmapping um, the digital transformation journey. But I'm pretty sure you didn't come uh, to this webinar to listen to, to the Innovation Valley Institute on my part, so I keep it very short and I um, uh, close my um, opening remarks at this point, hand over to Joan, and uh, she will guide us through the, the, the webinar and the presentations. Thanks. Thank you, Marcus, um, for that great introduction. So um, I'm going to be really uh, brave now, and I'm going to say Guten Middag to Willem. Ik heb er voor twee jaar in Amsterdam gewoond, toch een klein beetje Nederlands praten, en bijna alles nu vergeten. But you know, I, I, I'm probieren, trying. Okay, there you go. That's my best Dutch that I can muster. So you're very, very welcome. Thank you for joining us today. As I said, you're the CEO of the EIIT, uh, the European Institute for Innovation and Technology. I am going to keep my intro short to that and allow you to use all of your time to give us your presentation. Thank you so much. Bedankt. <laughs> Joan, bedankt voor uh, dit welkom in het Nederlands. Ik zal in het Engels verder gaan om de rest van het publiek ook uh, verstaanbaar te zijn. So thanks very much for having me here. It's my pleasure to share some of the experiences we have at EIT Digital when it comes to helping companies to scale in uh, Europe. Uh, you call it SMEs, uh, we call it startups and scale-ups, but it's more or less the same. Let me share my screen and hopefully that will be successful. So if somebody can confirm that it's all on the screen. Looks yeah. Excellent, thank you very much. So EIT Digital is a pan-European ecosystem and I would be bold enough to say that ecosystems are the future of innovation. And since our focus is on digital innovation, that's where we are. What is so unique about this digital ecosystem? Well, it's a European ecosystem. It's about digital and we are coming with a mission. We are coming with a mission of bringing European values to the digital world and that it is needed to bring them is obvious from the many discussions you see 
on the use of platform technology, on privacy, on fake news, on what have you in the digital world. And you clearly see that there are differences in what we in Europe consider important in terms of values compared to what you see in Silicon Valley, uh, where you see uh, dominance of big tech, or for example, in Asia, where you have another value set. So it's important that we are in that world. We have to step up because we have been quite leading uh, when you saw the end of the previous century, the first two decades, you have seen uh, other parts of the world taking over, especially where it comes to utilizing the power of the World Wide Web, the platforms, the social media, and the like. Our ecosystem has world-class European industrial players, and you can see at our website uh, who are that. And we also mobilize in our ecosystem the technology providers, the universities, the research institutes, the technology powerhouses in Europe. And finally, digital innovation, of course, is about building innovations, building technology, building ventures, scaling up SMEs, scaling up startups, but it's also very much about people. It's about talent, it's about digital skills, and that's why education is an integral part of what we are doing. We're well-placed in Europe. This is where we have our main offices. We have additional support offices in many countries in Europe. We're covering all of Europe with 18 locations, and we have an office in Silicon Valley because, of course, also we want to have a first seat look on how the developments are in the valley. We are here to build a strong digital Europe through education and innovation, as I said, they go hand in hand. And we picked a couple of areas that are really key for us to operate. And these are areas where Europe has not only a right to play, but also a possibility to win. That has to do with digital well-being, digitizing the strong healthcare system we have in Europe, a broadly accessible healthcare system, the industry, the digitization of our industry. In Europe, we have several clusters of very strong production industry, digital manufacturing going on, and you see the other topics here. What we are doing is we are integrating seamlessly innovation and education in this pan-European ecosystem. That means on the one hand, we have a funnel that supports the creation and scaling of digital companies in Europe, stand up, start up, scale up. And we have several activities there that are focusing on bringing teams, innovations, and also investments to the market. And then, of course, we have our education programs that is a focus with a focus on digital skills for the professionals, but also very much for attracting talent to Europe through our pan-European master education programs. When you look at what do companies need to be successful, they need as a baseline access to what we call ecosystem services. So they need, of course, technology that has, to some extent, a leverage to competitors. They need talent. In the end, an organization without people, what does it mean? And they need all kinds of other services that they can get from the ecosystem, partnerships, visibility, working, and the like. And of course, then what you really need to scale your company is in the early stages, access to finance to make it grow. But I always say the real money comes when your customers start paying for your services. So you need access to market. And that's what we are supporting. And you see some examples in the range where we are supporting. So we are supporting ventures across Europe in making transnational deals where they don't have their sales infrastructure there. They can use our ecosystem 
and to strike deals. And you can see the kind of deals that we are supporting them. We are not supporting them in the big deals, but we are supporting them in the range of half a million deals. And you see some examples here. And of course, the other part, which is very important in Europe is to raise capital for your venture. And what you see, Europe is very fragmented. In the US, you have more money, more concentrated. In Europe, you have to team up to mobilize it from different places. And that's where we use our investor network across Europe and pull investors together behind single investments in our scale-ups. And you see the area where we are focusing is the deals that sit between five and 20 million. If you need less, you can very often do it locally. If you need more, you will have been strong enough to get on the radar on the larger investment firms. And that will then work. But you have that this area in between where it's very difficult to raise money. If you need 10 million, it's, it's more difficult than when you need 50 million because then you are already far more mature. And it's also much more difficult than when you need only 1 million because you can do much more with local investors, angels, and the like. And you see some examples here as well. So this is a sidekick investment, which was actually at even a little bit more west than where you are where we uh, help them to raise 70 million for a round. And here is an 8 million investor of uh, a company that was generated out of our ecosystem. We helped them to create the company scaling up and then also get further on investments. So that's actually where our work is about and where we can help SMEs or startups or scale-ups, whatever you want to name them, to really get access to the market access to financing, but also to tap in to the talent, the technology that top pan-European ecosystem can provide. That's my short summary. We do a lot more, but I was given 10 minutes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Willem, and thank you very much for sticking to the time. Um, I don't have a particular, I know there's a whole passport required to go to Cork, but I don't think you have a separate language just yet. So I'm going to stick to plain old English to welcome our next speaker, the very brilliant Enda Keen from Tree Metrics. As I say, one of my favorite businesses that I've ever come across and always fascinated by what the guys are doing next. So thank you so much, Enda, looking forward to this. Thanks, John. Thanks for that nice uh, introduction. Um, so hi everybody, I'm uh, Forrester, one of the founders of TreeMetrics. I'm going to talk to you for a few minutes about the digital transformation of the forest industry. Uh, we're in business 15 years, been a long journey, a fascinating journey of learning. Um, as you can see from the map here, if I go full screen, we've been to over 35 countries around the globe collecting measurement information about forests globally and uh, yeah it's been a it's been a great journey and we're embarking on a, on a very new journey to further transform the industry which is going to be quite disruptive but uh, exciting and I'll, I'll talk briefly about that for a few minutes as well um a little bit about the global forestry challenge so forests cover 25 uh, percent of the world's land area um and and demand for wood is going to quadruple they reckon in the next in the next 30 or so years so a massive challenge for the planet. How do you how do you meet the demands for wood, for shelter, and for heat, and uh, and protect the world's forests? Which you know, ninety percent of the world's mammals live in forests, and and they are the, the, the lungs of the earth essentially. So there's huge pressure on global forests, um, deforestation, degradation. Yeah, carbon, you know, is is a huge subject. Um, big challenges around carbon as well, and uh, yeah, forests are under major major stress. Um, I'm sure you're all reading about the wildfires that are happening more frequently. You know, because of global warming, we're, we're seeing forests getting drier and putting putting serious stress on forests. Um, as a result, new insect attacks, for example, uh, diseases are spreading further, more frequent storms. So forestry is coming under massive, massive stress. And then you've got the stress from human pressure with deforestation for the ever-growing demand for food, uh, cheaper food. Uh, putting major major stress on, on global forests. So, yeah, Trimetrics, we've been in business 15 years and, and we, we have been trying to transform the industry. Essentially, the, the industry has a problem. One of the major problems is poor data, um, poor information about the forests. And here's just a little, a little quick summary of how we value a forest traditionally, globally in, in, in the world of forestry. The bottom portion of the tree is for the construction grade, which is worth about 80 euros globally. 
it varies from country to country. Um, you've got the middle portion for pallets um, and then the top portion for, for pulp and paper. And with the poor measurements of technology, predicting the volume of these products in the forest is, is a major challenge. As a result of that error, there's lots of risk and uncertainty. Uh, the forest owners, unfortunately, of which there, you'd be surprised to know there are 16 million private forest owners in Europe, and they don't have the knowledge of what's in their forest. And as a result, they're price takers. And I suppose at the end of the, at the, end of the day, the, the buyers and the middlemen are, are making huge profits on the back of that lack of knowledge. And Trimetrics, over many years, have helped a lot of those middlemen <laughs> and buyers and forest owners, but we are embarking on a new mission to, to transform the way the business is done and to help those owners to, uh, to really understand their value. And regarding digital transformation, over the 15 years, we, we've had to reflect, why are people afraid? There's a lot of blockers to digital transformation. And, you know, people on the ground are afraid when they lose their job. Um, people are afraid when the technology let them down. Uh, will their inefficiency be exposed? But, at the heart of a lot of it is uh, a lot of people don't want the knowledge to be transferred to the, the other person. So there's a lot of blockers out there. Um, here's one example, a pretty, pretty crazy case study in Ireland that we recently were involved with. A small farmer, west of Ireland, and he went to sell his forest. And he was offered by the first buyer 170,000 for the trees and the land. Uh, the next buyer came in and offered him 500, improved the offer to 550, and along came three metrics. And uh, we valued the forest at 930,000 and <laughs> a bit of a crazy, a crazy number of folks, but, but an amazing case study. And, and look, this is what we've been coming across all over the world. This is not just a unique Irish thing. It's, it's the, the lack of knowledge with the owner. So needless to say that owner, we gave him the confidence and the information and the knowledge to go and sell the trees directly. And he's a very happy person. And uh, I'm sure you'll be hearing more about this case study in the, in the, in the, in the future. Uh, and really, it's about it's about breaking those knowledge barriers, right? So, Trimetrics want to break down those knowledge barriers for those millions of owners all over the world. And, and to do that, we're we're leveraging uh, latest technology, like like everybody. Artificial intelligence is becoming more and more real, um, and we've embraced a number of these technologies, which I'll show you just one or two of them now in a second. But to go back 15 years ago, this is me with my. I get slagged off about my woolly jumper, but that was me back uh, 15 years ago in, in a forest in, uh, in Ireland near my city here in Blarney Castle. And we had this crazy idea to, to transform the way forests were measured using 3D technology. That scanner cost 80,000 euros, <laughs> a lot of money. <laughs> and it was a crazy idea that we could bring this around the, the forest and, and measure the, the trees more precisely. And from that data, predict the logs. So that, that image I showed you with the different logs, there were the different value points in the tree. Our simple vision was to, to use a 3D laser scanner to, to show the value before you cut the trees, to help the owner to get the best possible price and not be just a price taker. And uh, yeah, so you see, you see the break points. And, and, and what, the, what the buyers are doing, they're telling the owner there's loads of pulp in their forest, okay? And <laughs> there's less saw log. So it's a game. And, and if you don't have the knowledge, you're just a price taker. And uh, yeah, we, we went in and we, we, we tried to disrupt this world and it's been a difficult, difficult journey, but you know what, it's been amazing too. Here's, here's, a, here's my slide of my journey, which just goes to show you the incredible transformation that's happening in technology. That's me back in 2005. Eventually this new scanner came out uh, from Germany, from Stuttgart, from a company called Faro. And we use that technology now, it, that scanner, cost 35,000 euros. Along came this next scanner from a Swiss company um, from Leica Geosystems, and that scanner was uh, 25,000 euros. Getting smaller, getting easier to bring around the forest, but still nowhere near where we needed it to be. And, and with great excitement, a number of months ago, Apple announced that they were bringing 3D LiDAR technology onto the iPhone 12, which was a massive, a massive moment for Trimetrics. If you think back in my huge hunk of metal over here and major price point. We, we dived in straight after this technology, this, this, uh, this 3D scanner on the, on the iPhone. And it is amazing what it's doing and it's going to transform lots of industries, but we're determined to push this technology and this knowledge out to the farmers of the world. The, the many millions, there are 26 million owners in America alone, 16 million owners in, in Europe. So it's a, it's, a, it's a challenge now. How do we make all them people aware 
that this technology is available. And guess what? You can walk into the forest, take some pictures of your trees, and within minutes, we'll give you the value. So think back in my case study a few minutes ago with my farmer in the west of Ireland who had no clue, and he could have fallen into that trap and got a tiny portion of the value of his forest. So Treemetrics, what we've done is we've, we've partnered with a, Swiss, a Swedish company, which we'll be announcing in, in a couple of weeks, and we've embedded the data into our, into our cloud platform. And so we've got latest satellite mapping technology, our, our, our valuation software, our prediction software will all be integrated with the iPhone. And yeah, look, we, we, we know there's a world, a world of opportunity out there. And the big challenge now is to create the, to create the awareness of what we have. Um, another major, major market that's, that's emerging, rapidly emerging in America, I suppose COVID drove a lot of this on, is um, the emerging carbon market where forest owners are now getting paid for their carbon. And, uh, you know, you can see so many companies committing to, to net zero um, and that's going to continue. That's a, that's, I'm calling this a mega trend on, on carbon and three metrics want to be at the forefront of that, that verification, building the trust for the buyers of that carbon, that the carbon actually exists. And there's a lot of money going into using satellite technology to predict the carbon. But Trimetrics fundamentally believe it has to be from the ground up. You cannot predict what's in the forest without being on the ground and getting the measurements. And that's where we're excited with the likes of the iPhone. We also have uh, another project called the Internet of Trees, which is a, a Fitbit for trees that we've been working on. Um, it's a, a little sensor that goes to sleep. It's early days, but we're determined to continue to drive on this technology where the sensor wakes up every so many months and, and, and works out how much the tree has grown. And that's one way you build trust in your carbon markets. Um, so yeah, over the coming, just to wrap up, over the coming weeks, we've got uh, exciting announcements to make. We've, we've won some, some important contracts for our company. Uh, we've, we've some exciting partnerships that we're going to be announcing. Um, we're, we're obviously going to bring out these new products, leveraging these, these mega trends and these, these technologies. And it really is, it is a massive a digital transformation and disruption of our industry. Uh, just, just some people quickly to thank. Um, University of Man Manute University have been a huge help to us. Dr. Tim McCarthy in Manute has been a great supporter of us over the years in, in getting us the knowledge and the latest scanners, etc. Enterprise Ireland of us obviously have been a huge support over the 15 years. They, they were the first people who introduced us to the European Space Agency, who over the last seven, eight years, Trimetrics has leveraged the, the European Space Agency to help us to build our mapping systems and our communication systems, our GPS systems. Um, you see here, I just threw in some, so from a European point of view, we've done a lot of collaboration. Uh, the uh, Technical University of Dresden and uh, the uh, University of Freiburg have been a huge help. So yeah, it's been a, been an, a long journey, but, um, but an exciting one and, and, and we're, we're, we're aiming into a, a new, a very exciting future, but one that's going to cause a little bit of pain for people too. So, so yeah, we w watch this space as I say, and uh, listen, Joan, thank you for, for the opportunity and everybody who invited me to speak and I'll hang around for the Q and A if there's any questions and, and thanks very much. Okay. Now, I couldn't find the mute button. That and Enda had left me speechless again. I mean, <laughs> honestly, if, if ever it shows that an SME, the definition of SME is no reflection of the global impact that a business can have. Um, it's just, it's staggering to me. It's one of the most exciting businesses, always has been. I could wax lyrical and I'll never get on to the next speakers. Yeah, I'm going to get in big trouble. Enda, thank you so much. <laughs> but you, actually, it's really... It's really great that our next speaker is, is Greg Chu because um, I'm reading, I was reading through his bio and he's very, very carefully um, included in it. It says, um, Greg focuses on the emergence of new globally scalable solutions, leveraging distributed, lever lever distributed ledger technology, which to my mind that reads blockchain, right? And no, but you see, I'm always told that a distributed that what is blockchain? It's a distributed ledger. So, so it's not using blockchain, but it is about resolving digital ecosystems that solve systemic problems. And I think one of the things that always struck me with the work that Tree Metrics do is that that there is a systemic problem, and that it is that the really the really wicked problem solving things 
involve taking a whole ecosystem approach. So um, Greg Chu is our next speaker. He is the founder of QPQ, who do not do blockchain, but do do distributed ledger. So I am really looking forward to hearing your presentation. Greg, over to you. You may be muted, I cannot hear a thing. Thank you. Sorry, I couldn't find the, the mute controller that it had moved. Uh, forgive me. Yes, just to be clear, um, I would differentiate between blockchain and DLT in that um, blockchain is a, is a form of distributed ledger. It, it isn't the, the canon of the technology. Uh, it's a little bit like when you think of um, the internal combustion engine. The first one was in uh, 1882. It was a Daimler-Benz internal combustion engine. Um, what is it? It is part of a, a it is a technological canon that allows us to have self-propelled vehicles. Um, in that context, this is this is where I draw the distinction between what is blockchain, which is the 1882 Daimler-Benz engine, and what is distributed ledger, which is the canon. Um, it's a it's it's a difficult distinction because in the broad, it's become a little bit like um, Hoover was to vacuum cleaner. Uh, you know, people mean vacuum cleaner when they say Hoover, but it's it's difficult. But anyway, I think a lot of that actually comes from my side of the, the industry as opposed to everyone else. Uh, and we're the ones at fault. So who are we? Um, group of people that came together over the last three years uh, spread between Ireland, the UK, Singapore, uh, South Africa, Italy, uh, the Netherlands, and uh, the UK. Um, there is actually the, the, the guy in Singapore is missing from that particular map. It, it all began 2002 when I was working trading markets and I, I thought that uh, it looked, it was a bit silly that you had to go to different platforms completely to be able to trade on different markets. In fact, in some cases have different computers. Um, that I shelved, the, the first attempt I shelved in the, early, in the late 2000s and um, sort of kept taking notes and thinking about it, but that was the, the first iteration, it was a failure. Um, with the advent of blockchain technology, I, I saw there was a potential for change and that a, a new infrastructure may well emerge. Um, I could see that blockchain itself was extremely limited. It, it didn't have the capacity to scale. So it wasn't until I really got into understanding what a distributed acyclic graph is that I began to go, okay, well, actually this could scale, there is potential here. Um, because you know, I, when I look at it, I think in 2004, we were testing a transactional system that could operate at 400,000 transactions per second. Um, meantime, Bitcoin as a blockchain is managing six. Uh, at the time, um, Ethereum was running at about 16 to, to, not, to 20 per second. None of those things are sustainable for, for uh, you know, real commercial application. So uh, I began to bring a team together again at the end of 2017, beginning of 2018, we formed QPQ itself. Uh, what, so what we're building, we're building a digital financial network. Um, that network is about looking at, so if you were to think about how we transact, a lot of what we talk about as being FinTech is really just sitting up there at the application layer. It's it's just changing the, the user interface, really. It, it isn't actually getting deep down into the, the financial system, the transactional system. And ultimately, if you really boil it down, what are we missing? We're missing an internet of economics. So the internet of data allows me to go to somebody else's website directly. I don't have to go to a third party. I can share information with that person and through the web, that person can share information with me. Um, there's no need for third party intervention at any point in that process. That isn't true within the, the context of commerce and economics. So how do we make that true? Well, that's where we bring in the solution set that we've done. So treasury and custody accounts are the means by which we actually hold, control and move assets through the system. So they sit at sort of the universal level. Beneath that, you have the digital distributed digital exchange and network. 
which is, you know, we're very Germanic about how we name things at QPQ. It is exactly what it says on the tin. It's a network that crosses all the, brings all the treasury and custody accounts together, uh, can operate as near infinite number of transactions per second, and really brings that transformational point to distributed ledger to make it actually commercially viable and, and capable of sustaining the level of throughput and, and demand upon it that if we were to truly move all of our transactions out of the current semi-digital world and into a fully digital context, it has the capacity to provide that scale. Having built what I would then refer to as being the railroad, you know, that's the, the process by which everything moves around, which is your treasury and custody accounts and the distributed digital exchange network, we add on a layer that unlocks digitalization truly. Um, the idea we have is that you cannot have automation without human consent. So we patented a means of translating contracts, legislation, et cetera, into operative governing code. And that can actually totally automate all the processes of touching to any transaction. So stage one, build the internet of economics. Stage two, unlock the program economy with automation of human consent and contracts through the system. That then builds together, you have a, a, a digital financial network that underpins the entire commercial system, above which everybody else moves up to, to being closer to their clients. They, they're right there at the application level, and what they're providing is the value add, as opposed to the plumbing. Um, so here we talked about this why, you know, what is it that exists right now? As it stands, we have a system where the vast majority of what's going on is analog. It's certain, it's almost entirely analog on the governance side, but on the settlement side, it's mostly analog. Um, when you look at the, the process by which transactions move through banks, it still relies upon the SWIFT system or CPIF. Um, you're still seeing transactions being batched and huge numbers of, of batched transactions being processed by the, the uh, capital infrastructure for, for financial markets. Um, none of these things are really digital. And, and they're all prone to the same mistakes and all prone to the same errors and problems. So the technologies you've seen above that we bring together actually allow us to make the entire thing digital. And it, it has a huge impact upon companies' ability to, to survive in that context, to thrive in that context. But it also challenges a lot of the ways that we think that we're going to transact in the future. Um, how will companies act, behave, might they have fewer staff, but more people working on a contract basis? Might we have more people working? In a, this was a, a little bit of a conversation that was touched on before the thing began, that there will be changes to the way people work from the COVID era, but those changes are the tip of the iceberg relative to what's going to happen when we reach a fully programmable economy. So what's the, the output is to enable a digital universe of commerce. So we talk about the, the various component parts of our technology stack from the bottom up and together they enable all the different layers. So the QPQ platforms then enable digital products and assets, which enable sectors, which enable end users. So you see the inputs are contracts, regulation, compliance, oracles, the outputs, permission, real-time data, intelligent analytics near instant settlement and trade certainty, automation under human governance, secure custody and economic sovereignty. What's the opportunity? Well, the way we'd describe it is to make it simplistic as we talk about the internet of data. Well, the biggest players in the internet of data are Amazon Web Services, Microsoft Azure, Google Cloud, IBM and Oracle. So we are to the internet of economics as those five combined are to the internet of data. Opportunity there is obviously enormous. Um, the, the amount of work that needs to be done to get there is, is significant, but we're, we're approaching it in, a, in the same process by which you, you reach an elephant, one plate at a time, and preferably from the back to the front. Um, so, you know, we're starting at that base layer that underpins everything else. So where do we begin? We begin by talking to aggregators, big financial market institutions that provide the settlement services. Um, and I think, you know, distinctly from a lot of people in our industry, we're not coming along saying that we're here to disrupt you. I don't know if anybody here has ever heard me speak before, but you will hear, hear me say repeatedly, I dislike the term disruption because it's really not the right thing to be saying for somebody that you want to do business with. We're not here to disrupt you, we're here to enable you. 
We're not the people who are here to sack Rome. We're not the barbarians at the gate. We're the general who will tell you how to rebuild Rome in a way that will sustain it for another thousand years. Um, emerging from stealth, built to win. Uh, some people complained that we had been very quiet for a long time and we finally put up a website in July of last year. Um, simple reason for that, we exist in an industry with a vast amount of money from some excellent marketing, but absolutely no innovation. So we came at this the opposite way around. We're a deep tech company. We started by looking at a, a, a complete blank sheet as to how do, we, how do we solve these fundamental problems that currently inhibit the existence of an internet of economics. And this is what we've done. We, we've been very quiet. We sat in a, in a former agricultural building behind Intel in Leakslip for most of our existence uh, over the COVID era. Obviously, we've all been sitting in our, in our various uh, home offices. Um, and we're just starting to talk a bit more about ourselves now. Um, we're, we're, not, we're not saying everything, but we're, we're beginning to get that dialogue going in a broader context. And, and it was a pleasure to be welcome to this as part of that. Uh, we are starting to engage with more universities. Uh, we already have two that are working with us. Um, one, the National University of Singapore and the other in Subria University in Northern Italy. We have a formal relationship with uh, in Subria. Uh, we have a relationship with one of the professors at um, National University of Singapore, just to be clear. Uh, we are hoping to, to develop relationships with universities in the areas in which we have an operational base. So we are in discussion with some universities over in California, um, Virginia, uh, the UK, and I believe we I'm hoping that we'll start to get some responses from National University of Maynooth in the, in the coming weeks. Um, that's it from me. Apart from, from any questions you may have later, uh, I must admit, though, I, I need to leave at five o'clock because I have a, a client uh, call that has come in over the top that I have to attend. So my apologies if I can't answer all the questions. Happy to be uh, pinged on LinkedIn or any other social media for questions you may have if I can't be here to answer in person. Thank you all very much. Craig, thank you so much for that. I feel less bad for not having heard much about you guys before, because clearly you've been in stealth mode. So, so I feel less guilty. Um, and now I understand that the great need, having tried to move a pension fund from the UK to Ireland, as I said to them, Brexit negotiations were finalised and my pension is still in London. So don't ask, you know, I, power, more power to your elbow, as they say. Thank you so much. And um, and bearing in mind that so any Q&A, maybe pop them in here beforehand. and We can send them on to Greg or contact him directly. Now, that was a brilliant example of how we tried to make a virtual world more simplified and real for people as we think about economics. And it's a nice almost segue of the flip to our next speaker, who is Matt McCann, who wants to use take our physical world, make it more accessible um, through, through virtual, virtual technology. So um, this is a really interesting business um, in the context of how we are using technology, how SMEs, no more than three metrics, we can, an SME can tackle a global problem using technology um, and the, the power of people, I suppose, to, to upload and share all of that. So I'm delighted that our next speaker is Matt McCann from Access Earth. All of it. Matt, over to you. Thank you. Brilliant. Uh, thanks very much, Joan, and everyone for giving me the opportunity to talk to you about Access Earth for the next uh, few minutes. So, yeah, um, I'm Matt. I'm the CEO and founder of Access Earth Limited. And I started this kind of based on my own experiences, really, and struggles in finding up to date and reliable accessibility information. Survive cerebral palsy, which means as a result, my mobility is affected. And I'm dependent on knowing if a building, business, shop or restaurant is accessible to my needs before I begin my journey. This is, it's a universal issue uh, now, no more than ever with, with COVID uh, that affects more than just myself, but addressing it also provides kind of a massive opportunity. Um, essentially, our mission is to create the world's largest accessibility database. Um, and we do that kind of in three ways, uh, one in which we're a data provider, data aggregator, and a data gatherer, in that, you know, with a, with a dynamic accessibility database, we're sort of enabling people to empower themselves by both contributing data, but also allowing businesses to tap into this sort of lucrative yet kind of 
underserved um, global market um, as by means of saying that, you know, cities aren't designed for everyone, really, uh, as I've spoken at events before, where essentially the current urban environment tends to be designed for, for the mid-20s right-handed males, and that is not the majority of people. You know, it's, it's as a result of this, you know, there's huge commercial opportunities lost for businesses who are inaccessible or perceived to be within an, in an inaccessible town or city. Because of this, budgets uh, for using these conventional solutions are typically not up to date and therefore not being used effectively. And compounding this, we also have the global pandemic and the post-COVID recovery that's completely changed how people safely shop and interact with their local communities. So any solution has to be able to address these needs as well. Um, and we uh, do this sort of in, in, as I said before, three main ways, where first of all, uh, the platform sort of takes in data, both from crowdsourcing in a consumer facing app, where we have nearly 150,000 locations worldwide from this. Uh, but we're also have developed a number of AI and machine learning solutions that help to aggregate existing information from around the web. One of which we use, for example, with the European Space Agency, uh, we use satellite imagery to detect where accessible parking bays are because it's hard enough for me when driving around town when you could do and where to find places to park. So using the imagery, we're able to pinpoint where private and public spaces are for people. And then using that aggregator, it's not just useful for users like myself, but also for our clients in the smart cities and sporting space where they need to have intelligent insights into not just their immediate area, but also what their building may look like for an accessibility landscape, for example. So uh, in, a, in a stadium example, we're, we're starting to work on the internal mapping space, in particular in the times of COVID, we're being able to demonstrate where hand sanitizers are, if they're out of order, if the lift is out of order and safe occupancy levels. So we're really kind of, the pandemic has in some ways accelerated this sort of aggregation and providing side of our business where you know, we're able to essentially not just provide an experience for the user where they can find an accessible place to go and have coffee when it's safe to do so, but also to help enable positive urban city planning so that you know, in a post-COVID world, um, we can essentially come out of this making cities more accessible for everyone. Um, and our key route to market is kind of through our channel partners. So not just through in a sports stadiums example, we work with the Center of, for Accessible Football in Europe or CAFE, where we can work directly with uh, sports clubs and their uh, accessibility officers to um, help those clubs that want to become more accessible for the fan experience to do that. Um, and we work a lot with, as I mentioned, with the European Space Agency to kind of develop this sort of initial parking solution, but now also an internal mapping solution um, in partnership with kind of Galileo technologies and 5G to be able to map a user's journey through the stadium in a safe way. Uh, this can then be accelerated out to multi-venue events with our partnership with the Global Sports Innovation Center and Microsoft has allowed us to kind of, you know, take this from a small stadium or encapsulated example to kind of these larger full scale events that will <laughs> happen again eventually, just may take it, you know, a, a little bit of time post COVID. And of course they're gonna look entirely different. So accessibility and social distancing has now become the norm where everyone is acutely aware of what a two meter space is in a conference center. So designing the future of these kind of multi-venue, multi, -venue, multi crowd events is going to be absolutely key um, and then taking that a step further into the local and national authorities where we're very much ingrained in the smart cities network space and working with Maynooth directly on the um, shapes a research project with which is around sort of positive and uh, healthy aging in about 17 countries across Europe over the next four years has really been the sort of key to accelerating our initial um, growth over the last couple of years um, and sort of really because sort of where we are at the moment is in this sort of single event charge stage where we work with local authorities and sports clubs to kind of pr pr produce kind of reports on where they are in terms of an accessibility um, sort of roadmap and then as we move into phase one two and three 
uh, we work more directly on a software license and deployment chart. So we're, we're taking these insights and the data that we've developed and gathered over the years to then provide it in an easily consumable way, not just for the user, but for the building manager or for the event manager themselves. So where, for example, a user may see exactly how they can get from seat to seat, from their parking to their, to their pitch side seat, the building manager can also see insights such as what lifts are being used, are they out of order, what hand sanitizers are being used as well. So it's all about using insights and data to, to provide a safer fan and a safer sort of citizen uh, engagement experience as well. Um, so where we are and where we're looking to be now over the next two years has changed vastly based from sort of our, our adoption and use of, of AI and, and machine learning, you know, from being accepted in 2018 onto a place for uh, Microsoft's first AI for good cohort, um, in addition to getting Enterprise Ireland's startup funding, you know, we've been able to get about 150,000 places rated on the platform. Um, last year, we worked closely with Irish Smart Cities um, initiatives to really kind of give them a picture of what the, their town and city looks like currently. And um, in addition to adding COVID-19 criteria into our system, while initially we were looking at mobility as an accessibility piece, COVID-19 has become an accessibility criteria for everyone and will be for some time to come. You know, regardless of the vaccine rollout, you know, we're still going to be acutely aware of a two meter rule and, and face mask wearing and hand sanitizing. So um, in addition to that, over the next year, we're looking at kind of becoming, being able to take that criteria set and bring it out to everyone. So sensory and cognitive criteria are kind of key to this as well. And that's sort of where I'd mentioned the shapes project is really um, helping us to really broaden our, our, our data set so that we can, you know, essentially allow everyone to um, access Earth, because that essentially is our goal, right? We want to be the world's largest accessibility database. And so we, we reckon that by 2022, we're going to have 1 million locations mapped, with the majority of them being both internal routing as well. So um, yeah, I, I, that's essentially me at the moment. I'd be delighted to answer any questions. And uh, thank you again for the opportunity to talk. Um, yeah, it's great. Matt, thank you so much for that. I really, really enjoyed it. It brought back to me um, back in my early days, like in the 2010, 11, and we were looking at um, we we're looking at parking apps, you know, and, and they were very straightforward. And it was that crowdsourced, crowdsourced, you know, data and you know maybe a little bit of sensors or whatever, trying to find a parking space and or fix my street, various things like that. It's, it's seeing how it's progressed um, through the use of artificial intelligence, which is for me the, the, the big step change from where we were 10 years ago. But also I think you've raised a really important point in terms of accessibility um, in the user experience in the entire journey. It's not enough to have the space. It's how does, I, I have a meeting with the facilities management company tomorrow and you have sparked my little head. So I have to stop talking now and go into our next speaker because I could segue off here and be with you all day. But speaking of artificial intelligence, as if by magic our next speaker is using exactly that, um, in the whole talent space. So I'm very delighted to introduce our next speaker, John Morat. Have I pronounced that correctly? Well, you can uh, say Murat without the T. In French, oh, we don't say the last letter. Oh, okay. And where is that from? It's close. It's French. Oh, bienvenue. Ah, merci. I was expecting the same intro uh, in you French. J'étais en fille au pays en France il y a 27 ans. Donc, uh, je le parle un peu aussi, mais, um, okay, I better power on. Uh, that's, the, that's the extent of my languages for the day. We've got Dutch and French. Okay, and English. That's very good. But anyway, John, you're very, very welcome. Um, I am really interested to hear what you're saying. It's a huge challenge for a lot of SMEs in terms of recruitment, but also I'm really interested to hear what you guys are doing in terms of using artificial intelligence to really ramp up and improve the precision of recruitment and how AI can help that. So uh, over to you. Great. Well, thank you, Joan. So um, what I decided today to maybe focus more on sharing my background 
And uh, my experience with IVI and really explaining what we've been trying to, uh, to build in order to leverage artificial intelligence um, to enable um, very different type of companies uh, hire the best talent uh, through a, a different uh, way. So uh, just about myself briefly. So I came to uh, Ireland in 1995 from sunny France. Um, I've had the pleasure of uh, living in Ireland through the growth in the late 90s, which I had seen at the time many technology companies uh, that were uh, setting up and uh, therefore there were a lot of opportunities for employment. So I uh, myself as well started as well as a number of other people started in 1999 with a first recruitment business uh, because I uh, figured that uh, I should be able to help uh, some companies uh, try to find uh, French speakers or uh, technology professionals. Um, so that's how I started my career. So after a couple of years in recruitment, um, a lot of those major multinationals were um, crawling, I guess, to come to Ireland in a, a number of different sectors. So um, I saw the opportunity to really try to assist those companies in identifying the right uh, talent, especially the ones with language requirements, because at the time, um, Ireland in the, in the late 90s, the, it, was, it wasn't overpopulated with foreigners. Uh, they all came after uh, the, the year 2000. So I guess at the time it was quite challenging for those companies uh, to try to identify French speakers and Spanish speakers and German speakers. So um, we decided to set up the company initially to focus on the French speaking uh, clients and positions. Um, so we were organizing uh, events for companies like Apple, Hertz, and uh, many others in trying to attract French people to move to, uh, to Ireland. Uh, so that was quite popular. So we built a model to really assist major multinationals in their expansion, uh, initially in Ireland. And then we expanded our, our solution across uh, European markets. So we worked uh, over time with a large number of, um, of companies, some of the most popular, Google, Facebook, Apple, Kellogg's, Tesla, and many others. So that gave us a, a really unique experience into understanding the requirement uh, from those companies um, in Ireland, but also uh, on the field, as they called it, um, expanding through various European locations. So, um, so I did this for about 18 years. And after 18 years, um, there was one thing that was kind of bothering me is that in the human resources space, we were all doing the same thing, working the same way. So of course you had LinkedIn that came along and uh, started a very new model in terms of recruiting, which became very, very popular, which was about leveraging, um, I guess, a social angle to, um, to the talent space. So I decided to uh, really look into the uh, innovation side. So in 2018, I decided to uh, step back from my company um, and I looked heavily into HR technology. So the first thing I did, um, obviously the US are very advanced in terms of their technology. So I went over to the US, uh, looked at several uh, HR tech conferences to understand how artificial intelligence was improving uh, the recruitment space. So I came up with a lot of different products and I was really amazed at the potential technologies that, uh, that could be used to uh, identify talent. Uh, in the same time, the shortage in Ireland and across Europe was increasing and social media was being uh, used in, in a much, uh, at a much greater scale. So um, I saw the opportunity to create talent cloud media to really tap into uh, social media users. So social media has about 3.8 billion users. You can imagine that I suddenly thought that this could be uh, the largest talent pool ever. Um, the question was how were we able to identify potential talents? Um, and I thought that using the principles of digital marketing could really help us uh, in trying to identify the right uh, users. So our goal initially was to uh, really understand the user types, um, really see how to create attractive job uh, ads and also employer branding ads so that we would put those ads in front of the right people. Instead of broadly looking at your organic posting, which uh, a majority of companies were doing at the time, uh, we looked at very specific 
uh, people and user types so that we could ensure that there was a higher conversion of interest from those people and not just your random ad. So after a couple of years uh, building ad campaigns within Talent Cloud Media, we had the opportunity to work with a, a good number of companies. And it's actually very funny because uh, it's the, the third mention that I will make to the European Space Agency uh, because um, a couple of people have mentioned them uh, in, in the earlier presentation. But the European Space Agency was uh, one of our clients last year where we did a full employer branding campaign for European locations uh, as they wanted to go on a hiring spree for technology and engineering professionals. So that was one of the type of clients we worked with, as well as various technology companies like McAfee, Deloitte, and even your Harvey Norman, for example, who wanted to open new stores uh, in Dublin a couple of years ago. So it was very clear that we were doing that campaign uh, manually, but we need to really automate. We needed to build a robust software, and we need to we need to make sure that we use artificial intelligence and various data analytics to really scale the offering of our product, uh, because manually we could only go so far. So we wanted to really reach deeper into social media, really understand how to identify specific users. Uh, find hidden talent, as we as we call it, uh, on all the major platforms, really based on their interests, their skills, and their behaviors. So we started looking at hundreds of uh, different data to potentially find the right talent pools. So we looked at people's interests, we looked at who they followed, what they were sharing, and so on, so that we could use then programmatic advertising to show them the right position. So in 2020, and that's where we went through our digital transformation, it was actually a very right time for us. Um, it was a challenging year for everyone with a major slowdown that, that was impacting heavily the recruitment sector. So we saw that as a real opportunity to uh, focus on building our own product. So um, our digital transformation through IVI started then because we wanted to Try to bring that innovation using AI into the talent acquisition space. So we looked at various research institutes, and we ended up choosing IVI at Menud after uh, several calls. Um, actually, got on great with Marcus. Um, so we felt that Marcus's expertise, uh, the background that the research projects had been had been worked on, and also what we were expecting was the right uh, partner for us. So we felt that uh, Marcus and his team would be able to guide us through uh, the different options so we could map out our product, we could uh, build our feasibility uh, model so that we could ensure that we would achieve our certain goals. We also wanted to research which technologies we could leverage, um, what was the impact from AI to digital marketing, and really try to get us uh, to have a deep understanding of our users and also um, how we could optimize uh, ad campaigns on social media because, as you can imagine, it's a very uh, scattered, very busy uh, platform. So we needed to be sure that we would, um, using AI, that we would be able to uh, automate the process in optimizing the best ads for the right people. So we worked um, heavily with Marcus and, and, and his team, and they've been really great through the various stages of, uh, of the research. Um, we had weekly calls, we really reset every expectation, every goal that we need to, uh, to focus on. Uh, we reset that every single week. We were able to build a stronger and stronger roadmap to start looking at how we could develop a product. So we really focused on building out the analytics uh, features and look to what sort of uh, artificial intelligence algorithm could enable us to augment and automate our reach within social media. So today, um, where we stand, we have uh, completed a certain amount of work with Marcus and the team. We've at the stage where we have, uh, we are very close to having our first version of our product. So our product um, will be consisting of um, understanding the analytics of the potential talent pools on social media cross-matching that with uh, what we call market and brand analytics. So the market analytics enables an employer to look at their competitors, to look at salary guidelines, and the brand analytics 
that enables the employer to look at the brand sentiment from an employee point of view. So the employer using our platform can then look at what talents are available on social media, um, how are they engaging with their brand and what's their sentiment about their brands and what is the market dictating it in terms of the, com the competitiveness and maybe what they need to focus in terms of their content messaging. From that, we are building a tool that will enable the employer to post their job ads on multiple platforms from your Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, and so on. We will be building those as, as we move forward um, so that the employer can actually leverage the full extent of social media to attract not only just targets, but attract talent. Because in recruitment, one of the key facts is that um, today you really focus on um, having job ads everywhere so that people apply. Well, we are actually putting the job ads in front of the people on social media. So we are looking to expand. But just to conclude, I know, Joan, you are uh, calling me up there. Just to conclude, um, we're looking to expand across various locations. We're currently present in uh, Europe. We'll be expanding in the US. But I want to really extend um, our thank you to Marcus and the team. I mean, from Goldtekan and Paul, they've been closely involved with us. It's been a great experience. And we're looking forward to continue our relationship with IBI. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Uh, clearly, I wasn't here living in Ireland in 2000. I was still living in Amsterdam, learning Dutch. Oh, and I'd already learned my French. So, you know, I, I could have had a job here. Who knew I could have come home when you were looking for the foreign language speakers. We have a question that's come through for you, which I'm going to let you think about. Okay. And then we're not going to answer till we get to the Q&A. But it was actually this point, and it's one particularly close to my heart, because I don't have domain expertise in that traditional sense. And it's the question of transversal skills. And how has AI developed to be able to identify the transversal skills that would make somebody a, maybe an amazing hire for a job, but does not have that very, I suppose, linear functional domain expertise for it. And how can AI help with that? So I'm going to leave you to think about that. And I am going to introduce our next speaker. But John, thank you so much. Merci beaucoup. OK, so our next speaker, our next speaker is Louis Ryan of Ash Technologies. I'm just gonna make sure I've turned my camera off. Um, and Louis is um, with Ash Technologies. And again, a subject very close to my heart because um, they have developed electronic magnifiers for the visually impaired. Now I am not visually impaired, but if you have tried to read the instructions on the back of a packet of food or indeed anything else in the last year, you will realize that you actually need to take a photograph of it on your phone first and then enlarge the photo because I can't read it, not with the best light in the world and, and I am not visually impaired. So um, that is my personal interest in our next speaker, but really, really important technology. Um, so Louis, I'm delighted to invite you to turn your video on and I am going to hand over to you and you can, oh, your slides are up there already. So it's perfect. Welcome. Thanks very much, Joan. Um, I'm probably going to disappoint you on the visually impaired side of things, but um, oh. I, I'll do my best. And thanks to the advice for inviting well, you me. You don't need to sort my problems out. I think you're sorting out far more important than my funny little ridiculous ones around reading instructions. But crikey, they're not accessible. So True. anyway. So, um, yeah, so basically, we start off with the history of ASH, and it did come from ASH developed um, digital magnifiers for the visually impaired and was quite successful at it and very, very innovative. Um, but probably starting in the year 2000, that whole market started to become commoditized with cheap Chinese imports. And in 2013, ASH basically decided to to a business model shift to inspection. Um, because the, even though the magnifiers were for digitally or visually impaired, the quality was really, really high. Um, so that that had that continued um, on, the, on, the, on the inspection side, and we developed a range of products um, for inspection, measurement, um, and some of so you know, th this is an example of our Om Omni Tree. Uh, I won't go into too much detail because it's not what we're here for, but the most important part of it is it's, it's, a, it's a manual and semi-automatic inspection system. So it requires an, op an operator. 
to put, place the parts under it and run it. And the most important part of it is the superb image quality. Um, we have spent a lot of time developing our own camera. Uh, it's a zoom camera that you know, a field of view can just vary from 250 millimeters down to one millimeters. Um, so we've a lot of patents on that on that technology. Uh, our customers, here's a selection. So we try to go with the high end customers uh, as much as possible. And I get to what we're here, what we're here to talk today about. So over the last number of years, we've been working on developing the technology for artificial intelligence. Um, and we worked with a number of select customers. Uh, we didn't broadcast it. Um, and we basically have four basic uh, tools that we use. So we can use classification. So if you feed the artificial intelligence an image of a cat, it'll predict a cat. We can detect objects. We can segment objects and we can do anomaly detection. And probably a video is worth a thousand words because part of this was as to how we market this, this system. So the, the way that we market is we, when a customer contacts us regarding this, we ask them for samples and we create a video showing them the acumen at, at work. So this is an example from British Sugar, which they're quite happy for us to show. So these are cells, uh, yeast cells for the brewing in industry, and they, they need to determine how many cells are in the sample and how many are dead, how many are alive. And previously, the way they did it, they had a optical microscope and a manual clicker. So a person would look over the, look into the microscope and, and every time they kind of see a cell that they click a, and they get a, man, a manual count. And it was highly inefficient and error prone as well. So we, we developed an AI solution for, for them that automatically detects the cells, counts them, and as it does over a number of samples and does a calculation, produces a, a report at the, at the end. So they end up with full traceability of each, of each sample. Um, then there's another one that is quite in, interesting. So they, a lot of instead of um, instead of spraying pesticides on crops to kill their pests, what's happening a, a lot now is that companies are are breeding mites. They're called predatory mites, and what they do is instead of spraying pesticides, you actually spray mites, and the mites attack the pests that attack the crops. So it's very green and eco eco friendly, um, unless you're the pest, I guess. But uh, so we've developed work with two different companies on this and develop solutions to track mites, to you know, track whether they're dead or alive. Um, these, these are actually flower mites that were, came from one of our engineers' uh, cupboards. Uh, we can't show the, the real thing because it's, it's under N, N, NDA. Um, but this is where we use the artificial intelligence to count, track, and then measure the quality of the samples that are sent that are sent sent out um this is another example where a pharmaceutical company was looking to to, to make sure that their vials were in perfect condition so i'll just go through this so if there's any defects on the top of the vial we need the ai to detect it and as you can see once the movement stops, the AI kick, kick, kicks in and automatically detects any defects. So any anomaly to what the system was expecting will be highlighted and it's all done in real, real time. Um, we also do things like PCB inspection. So this a customer wanted to be able to identify what components are the, that correct components were on the board in the correct position. So ICs were detected with a red dot, resistors with yellow, and capacitors with green, and that's all they wanted to 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 make sure that 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 the right component was in the right place. So we developed the AI system for them, and in this case, you can see it has failed because there's a there's a missing resistor and a missing capacitor. 
And again, it's all it's all done in real real time, and there's a missing resistor on this one. But not only do we um, develop this for other customers, we also use machine learning within our own uh, facility. So when a camera takes images, generally there's some there can be optical distortions at certain zoom levels. So that should that should be a straight line, but it's not. Um, and this can lead to, when you try to do some measurements, this can lead to very high errors. Um, so this is an example of measuring 10, mil 10 millimeters here and the same here. They're, they're fairly equal at the bottom, but there's a huge difference at the top. So this, this, this introduces a lot of errors when you're trying to measure. So we've developed software. It won't be as pretty as what we do for the customers because it's all for in-house. Um, but we use a system that basically emulates a swarm of birds trying to find food. Uh, it's called particle swarm optimization, and there's other optimizations that we can do as well. So we can read in real data, which is a grid, and you can see the grid is warped. And our job is to find a matrix and a polynomial basically to fix to fix to fix this. So if we if we start a system. The red dots are where it's the, it should be, the, the dot should be, and the black dots are where the, the algorithm is learning to correct the image to match. Um, what's, 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 what's really important is here, this is, this is the measurements on the distorted image, and these are the measurements on the undistorted Im image. And you can see very quickly the system will Correct. So the, the starting error in this case, I think the largest is 248 microns. And after doing this, the, the, the biggest error here is eight microns. So it significantly improves the quality of the measurements. Um, there's one other one here, and uh, this is the this is the final the final one. That another example of what we do. So to achieve a really high image quality, um when we have a color a color chart here as a reference standard but you can see the colors are very dull and any camera sensor basically will produce this type of dull image and they have to be corrected within the system within the system so we have a process here where we can for each camera we can detect detect the color the standard universal way of doing it is to find an inverse matrix i won't go into the detail but basically this is the starting color, this is what it should be, and this is the end, ending color. Um, and it has corrected pretty, pretty well. But if you notice here, like on the likes of the blue, it doesn't, it, it still isn't exact, an exact match. And for some of our customers, this is really important that they get the color that, 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 that they need. So again, using the machine learning te technique, we're able to correct these colors. And you can see now the blue, and is a, almost a, perf a perfect match. And if we look, if we flip between the two, this is this is this is the in input to the system, and this is the output. So you get a nice, really vib vibrant range of um, of colors out 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 of it. So we 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 de we developed on the marketing side. We developed this technology over a number of years. I say with a few select customers. We only really launched it live out to the public or out to people in general um the end quarter four last year and thankfully our biggest problem right now is actually trying to handle the number of people who want to use the technology it is absolutely uh exp exp exponential um so it's it's exciting it's very exciting times um for for the company and it it just looks like we're you know it's another it's another complete business shift in what in what we do. So with with that, I leave it. Um, and thanks for listening. Looking for my own unmute button. <laughs> Thank you so much for that. That was really fascinating. Um, like on a load of levels. Obviously, I work in Siemens, so this is technology that you know I would be familiar with, but the one on pests and predatory pests, I can't unsee that. So if I have nightmares later on. I am blaming you, but um, Louis, that was super. Thank you so much. Um, I am.
we are we are we are nearly there we are doing great guns on timing and um, i'm going to encourage people to start putting in their cues for their q a um, right now but without further ado i am going to introduce you all to our final speaker today which is alan darcy of anim technologies and um, alan has worked in mobile network operations for years developing solutions for them i think um what with working from home in the year we've all had uh, i don't think we've ever been more conscious of the importance of our access to telecommunications and mobile networks um, and our reliance on those so i'm really interested and delighted that um alan is joining us uh, this afternoon as our final speaker and to thank all of our other speakers for keeping us so well to time i'm not going to ruin that for everybody now so i'm going to hand over thank you very much alan okay hi thanks thanks john and, and thanks to marcus and the ibi for the invitation to speak to you today so um the other uh, presentations are also very interesting so i'm going to talk today very quickly about the anim innovation journey and the journey that we've been on in anim for the past three years on innovation so anim is a, an irish company we were founded in 2012 and we are industry leading experts in the area of sms fraud and security so what we do is we work with customers and we provide technology by way of an sms firewall and we provide monetization services on top of that technology to ensure that the messages, the SMS messages we all send and receive, that those messages passing through networks are free from fraud and spam, and that the mobile network is part of the revenue chain for those messages. So we're headquartered here in Ireland. Uh, we have an office in Malaysia, and last year we opened an office in Kenya. And we point to presence then where we have one or maybe two people dotted around the world from places as far as Vietnam uh, to El Salvador and lots of different places in between. So our customers are mobile network operators and we're lucky enough to have customers in 85 different countries. Um, our nearest customer is in Oslo and um, they range as far away as Fiji and we process traffic for over 650 million subscribers. So in the pre-COVID days, we used to average visiting between 45 and 48 countries a year. Um, and we visit no countries in the past 12 months. So it's been a, a different experience for us and how we meet with our customers and how we engage with our customers over those th that time. So when we, we look at innovation in Anim, uh, three years ago, we identified a requirement to put a, a focus on, on innovation. And the reason we did that was that we, we felt that the internal perception of innovation within the company was poor. Um, there, we had worked with Enterprise Ireland on an SME assessment, and they flagged that innovation was one of the weaker elements of our offering. And it was also an industry report where our customers, um, despite voting us as first in our segment, also identified that innovation could have been an area we, we would work to improve on. We also felt that an innovative environment would help us uh, with our staff morale and retention. We worked very hard to build our team and to build a really great culture. And we wanted to do everything we could to hold on to that team. And then obviously we wanted to work to extend and then create our new revenue streams. And, and I guess the real challenge we had was that we fix really complex problems for our customers, but we felt it was a business as usual activity. So presented with a real challenge, we'd fix it and we'd say, that's just what we do. That's just normal for us. We didn't really acknowledge that some of the, the problems we were fixing, the ways we fixed them were very, very innovative. So we wanted to go about changing it. And we wanted to see how we could establish what we call a 24 seven innovation culture and how we can build that engine in, in the company so that we can create a more innovative environment working with the team to help them innovate better. And then by doing this to improve the perception within the company and within our customers that we, we, were, um, we could be better at innovating. So how did we go about it? So this was a really important element that we decided to put in place a, an innovation board. And we had a real mix of talent at that innovation board. So we asked Martin Curley, who is the director of digital transformation at the HSE and was also co-founder of the IPI to come on and help us with this journey by chairing our board. We then had Professor Jerry Byrne, who is former Dean of Engineering in UCD to come on board. We had great support from our CEO, who's really passionate about innovation, uh, innovation and driving the company forward. And then we brought on board two graduates because we felt it was important to get a different view. And we created this board. 
um, we wanted to, to, to draw a line in the sand and, and see where we were and, and what, what areas we could improve on. So we engaged with the team at the IVI and we carried out an assessment with the team. And that assessment provided us with real valuable information. So it identified that they felt that there was strong management support for innovation, but they felt they needed better training and they needed better information on how they could innovate and, and recognize innovation. So using the board, we put in place an objective, some deliverables, a vision and a mission. And over the next while, at our regular company presentations, we, we emphasized innovation and we called out really good innovation. We presented an award to people who we felt were innovating well. And then we presented some of our, our, our journey at the ISPIM conference um, in June last year. One of the biggest light bulb moments for us when we started our journey was that innovation didn't just uh, relate to our product. So if you had have asked us previously, what is innovation? It would be inventing a new product. But working with Martin and the team in the IBI, we identified that innovation could be right across our business. So it could be organizational. It could be in how we work with our customers. It could be on the product side. It could also be on the process side, so how we can improve our processes. It can be on the marketing side. Um, and the two phrases on the right hand side are something that we, we remind ourselves of at, at every, uh, every innovation meeting. It's, and I guess the idea is that you never forget your customer. So, you know, in all the innovations and everything we have is how is that going to work with our customer and how is it going to improve our customer? And then I think our, our CEO's favorite presentation is that research and development turns money into knowledge and um, innovation turns knowledge into money. So. That's the different types of innovation we, we, we put in place. So we have some examples of how the innovation. So um, what we did was we encouraged all our team to speak with a lot of water cooler moments, with a lot of, of different people and different teams coming together, discussing challenges and seeing how we could improve them. So we have four simple examples here. We have one example in, in penetration testing, which is an element we do for our customers, whereby by implementing some tools that one of our graduates had actually used in university to replace a manual effort. We could reduce the effort from 40 hours a week down to five. On the HR innovation, prior to COVID, we had already introduced some flexible working hours and some working from home structure for our team and put processes in place around that. We'd encouraged everybody to use 10% of their time on innovation or outside the box thinking. Um, with one customer, we, we use some, some different ways of looking at some of the challenges they had within their network in terms of spam, and we're able to reduce the, the, the amount of spam or unwanted SMS on their networks by over 99%. And then we put in place a, what we call a, an iron project, which is an increasing revenue on our customer networks. And that's focused on driving revenue for our customers. And by driving revenue for our customers, it also drive revenue uh, for Anum. But when COVID started this time last year, we had a real challenge because our greatest area of innovation was our, 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 can, our canteen and our water coolers and people coming together with, our, with ideas and challenges. So we put in place what we called our innovation and isolation project, which was a way of allowing people to identify areas of improvement across the whole span of the company. Uh, we categorized them and linked them in together. And then we put in place small project teams and we encouraged these teams to meet at lunchtime to have these discussions. Uh, we used uh, increased use of online tools such as Trello to track our progress and how we track all the different ideas we capture. And then we create a Slack channel so that people can come in, can comment, can add value to it. One of the other things we put in place is a regular lunchtime session. So last June, we put in place a, a mechanism whereby we would on a Friday at lunchtime have different speakers come in and present to the team on really diverse subjects. So both internal and external presenters. So two weeks ago, we had a presentation on design thinking. We might otherwise have a presentation on a participation in an industry group. So really diverse thinking in a nice casual environment that allows people to come together on a Friday at lunchtime and just have a discussion. We always have a panel in place. We're trying to build as far as we can in the, in the online world, some of those kitchen discussions and water cooler moments that worked really well with us. Um, and then in terms of our results, so we've been very lucky. We've had really strong growth within the company in the past few years. So we've had 100% growth in our, in our team and we've been really lucky in our retention. We've been able to maintain and keep the, all our team together. We've opened an office in Africa last, late last year. We, we won our first customer in South America 
and um, hired our first staff member in El Salvador, working very uh, well with that guy. We've had really, really strong increase in revenue. Um, and in, in late 2020, we put in place a new corporate strategy, which we're calling Towards 2024. And innovation is a key element. So it's been recognized that it's a key element to support the growth of the company. Uh, we've won some industry awards, which are really nice that we're now recognized um, as being a leader in our area. And you know, we think we're only getting started, that our journey is still in its, in its infancy and that we've got great ideas on how we can really drive to improve our innovation focus um, and improve the results for the company. So that's all I have. I hope that um, was helpful. That was beyond helpful. It was actually a really, really smashing way to round up because it shows us how you've gone on that innovation journey, which is really interesting um, in terms of how you've dealt with it in the COVID world. And it reminded me of one of the conferences that we did with the, one of the series that we did last year with the IBI. And I remember, I'm trying, it's been racking my brain trying to remember who it was, but it was definitely a woman and it was around May time. And she was asked, what was the biggest learning that I had out of COVID? And she said, well, we've become much better at prioritizing. You know, because you've got kind of more scarce resources, everyone's not around. So we re they had to be really, really sharp about what they were going to prioritize. And it struck me that you've got all this innovation juices flowing. And one of the questions I will have in a minute will be, I'm going to leave you think about it, is with so many innovations, we can't do everything. So what process do you guys have in place for evaluating, prioritizing which ones to proceed with and you know, evaluating those? So I'm going to leave you to ponder sure. on that question for a moment. I'm going to pop into the chat. I'm going to ask all my panelists to turn their cameras back on, assuming you're all you know, still here and still presentable. Yes, this is all good. We have a, an on show from everybody. Um, well, first of all, I should say thank you so much for the brilliant presentations and Donkey Bell and Merci Boku and Gurumila Mahagat. So that's me covered um, internationally for the day. Um, but they were really, really interesting and all in so many different ways. And I guess great credit to the guys at the IVI and um, for pulling all this together because there was a natural segue and there were, you know, themes running throughout and um, particularly around artificial intelligence. But I think the most overriding one for me is that when we hear the word SME, a lot of people will think small to medium sized business and they don't understand that actually in our technology driven world, small to medium sized businesses can have massive global impact. And I think every one of you has shown that. So as well as a thank you, also a massive congratulations. And, uh, and for being such, um, I suppose, great role models for anyone who's listening in today. We still have 54 participants. So uh, there's no questions in the, in the question box, but um, I am going to ask a few. So what I'm gonna do is, John, you've had the most time to think about your question. And it is one that applies to everybody anyway. So um, artificial intelligence, transversal skills. The question to you is how good is artificial intelligence in identifying transversal skills? And then my question to everybody else is how much do you value and prioritize transversal skills, the ones that can be applied across all sectors, or is the value for you still always going to be in domain expertise? So John first, and then the rest of you can have a think. Well, thanks, John, for the question. Um, so first of all, I guess that um, the answer is yes, artificial intelligence could definitely assist in uh, the talent assessment uh, part of, uh, of things. So um, there are multiple ways in which artificial intelligence uh, can look at someone's personality. I mean, the most simplistic one is uh, one which we actually work on with Marcus. It's the big five model. So it's a, it's a proper personality assessment. Um, you can also use the DISC model. Um, so those are well-established, long-standing, standard personality assessments. Um, so what AI enables is access to data to uh, really drive a sort of sample uh, for each individual that is put through an assessment 
to uh, be benchmarked against the industry standards. So therefore, um, AI can facilitate maybe the discovery of alternative skills that someone can uh, can have. So, so that's in the, the talent assessment piece. There's also the training. The training is a very interesting one because um, there are several training platforms now who leverage artificial intelligence to enable um, a kind of very user-driven uh, mechanism, which means that based on the initial assessment from the, the user, uh, the AI will recommend um, what are the most suitable uh, kind of cross-functional trainings that a user can, uh, can take, and depending obviously on the, on the, on the goal in which they want to achieve. Um, and, and the third example that I would use uh, with, with AI is the video interviewing. So there's a great uh, tool that was built a few years back. It is called HireView. And HireView use uh, full-on predictive analytics. So when the user is, is on the video, like we all are right now, the AI is actually using computer vision to assess the behavior of the interviewee so that it can make some recommendation as to if that person is comfortable, confident, um, with good communication skills. So it kind of defines various areas um, that can enable the talent acquisition person to either recommend that person for a particular job or maybe suggest different. Okay, um, that, that freaks me out just a little bit. <laughs> If I had to do that, um, more like a screen test. I think um, one of the things that I've been talking a lot about in the last year, Alan, I am available to do this for you guys if you want me to. I'm conscious my colleague Siobhan is listening in. She's going to go, Joan, you were shameless. But anyway, um, the World Economic Forum identified three skills, transversal skills, most required for the fourth industrial revolution. And they were critical thinking, complex problem solving, and creativity. And one of the things that I have felt we're, we're very good at educating people on and providing um, that kind of training that John has alluded to is in relation to that whole area of complex problem solving and critical thinking. A Little bit more challenged on how we cultivate uh, creativity in our organizations and, uh, and drive a culture of creativity. So I've been doing this for fun, Alan, for fun, talk on how I apply the principles of painting, which I do, to driving innovation. And actually, I have basically said that innovation is a conceptual art form and how we need to, and how people can genuinely develop their muscle for creativity and become more creatively fit, um, which will ultimately help in creative, critical thinking and complex problem solving. So that's my offer to you, Alan, if you would like me to do that as one of your lunchtime talks, very happy to. And to everybody Definitely. else, do you agree that those three skills are the critically important ones in terms of transversal skills? And I'll start with, I might go to Enda from a hiring point of view. Are you looking for another forester or are you looking for somebody who has those critical thinking or complex problem or creativity skills and could you teach them the rest? No, great, great question. Um, not looking for another forester. <laughs> um, oh, I was about always, to polish my axe. <laughs> always looking for um, people who can solve complex problems. And Louis gave a great example of some of the stuff he's doing with, as an example with uh, AI, for example, and, and uh, counting the insects or the yeast inside in a cell dish and so forth. So tree metrics, we're trying to use the same approach for counting the trees from a satellite image or from a drone image and so forth. And, and a couple of years ago, we brought in a young guy from Trinity who, who was doing his, uh, his master's in, um, in artificial intelligence. And he just blew us away with, with the capability of AI and what it was all about. I, I was reading all about it, but until I saw it in action, I didn't really know what it was. And so that, that, that blew my mind away with regards to the possibilities of, of AI and, and, and many other tech technologies. But um, yeah, creative thinking is one that um, is one that I'm trying to get all my colleagues and, and friends and anybody who knows me to just to help us with the creative thinking piece, you know, that, that uh, it, it, you know, you, the more ideas, the better. And, and how do you encourage people to come up with ideas is, is, is a real challenge because sometimes you feel you, you know, on a Monday morning, you arrive to work and you were the only one who was thinking about how do we, how do, we uh, do things better? So, um, yeah, there's, there's definitely a need for um, 
innovation and creative thinking and on your point about art by the way i there's definitely something in what you're in what you're saying there because some some people either see things or they don't it's amazing and uh, well, i think if anyone in this around this group on this call has seen a cardboard box or seen a child with a cardboard box you would realize and you would know for sure that everybody is born creative and i actually i i, I seriously believe that it is impossible to learn a language without a degree of creativity. It is impossible to, to learn as much as we do as small children, unless we are intuitively creative, unless we know how to experiment and try things. So I believe the people are born creative. And over time, some people keep that creative muscle fit. And some people like any other level of fitness, let it fall away, you know? And I don't think everyone who goes for a run is gonna necessarily compete in the Olympics but you can be a healthy level of fit. And I, and I think you can be a healthy level of creativity and, and have flex that muscle without necessarily expecting to, you know, hang my paintings in, you know, the National Gallery, but it, it's how to maintain that fitness. And I actually think we can go back to that. So my offer is open to anyone actually who's listening. Um, but actually I, I noticed Matt and uh, Louis, am I missing anyone who's not Euro using the European Space Agency data? Like seriously, you're a walking ad for those guys and they are absolutely amazing in the data they have. And they are crying out for companies to use their data. They're literally yeah. begging companies to use their data. So, you know, you guys are brilliant examples of how that is happening. Um, Alan, I left you with a question. At the, no, do you know what I'm going to do? Before I let you, before I go to your question, I'm going to, to let Matt, who was nodding quite a lot. I can't see if Louis nodding because I don't have him on camera. I know he's got some technical problems on that. But um, Matt, you were nodding on that creativity piece. It sounds like it's something that definitely resonates with, with you as a software developer who's doing something kind of different. Oh, no, completely. And particularly when you have a small team, you have to be creative in how you're going to solve problems quickly and in a kind of an efficient way because and that's as you try and like build out the team as well like creativity and critical thinking are kind of key for us in terms of you know uh, you always have to hire someone better than you or who thinks differently than you because otherwise you're going to end up in this echo chamber of and then wonder why the ship is sinking when you're all thinking the same like it's well, absolutely I, key i think what's really interesting because artificial intelligence on the principle it's based on and kind of like machine learning on rules and predictability okay the one thing you will learn about artists is that they think irrationally and the one thing we know about people is that they will behave irrationally so if we're developing things based on artificial intelligence which are predictive and rational then we're not necessarily factoring in the irrational which is how people are more likely to behave and that kind of gets me thinking about how if all businesses, so if all people are educa educated equally and all develop algorithms based on rules that are created equally, then how do you get competitive advantage? Where is the spark? And that for me is the human irrational element. So I'm going to leave you all ponder on my crazy and I'm going to go to Alan with his question. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Well, just to follow up for that, that was one of our real challenges because we, we, a lot of uh, our team came from core mobile network development where there, were, there is zero risk. Everything must be highly structured, highly disciplined. There's no room for error. So when you come to these guys and we're trying to tell them, you've got to innovate, you have to come up with new ideas. They're good, but I can't because I can't make a mistake. So what we try to do is identify soft areas around the edges whereby there is a slight bit more tolerance for that element of failure. And um, while still maintaining the core discipline that we needed and that's required. So that, that's just to, 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 to get back to your main question. What we did was at the start of our innovation and isolation, we got lots of ideas. And, and what we did was we just characterized them into five different sections. So some were tools, some were products, some were process. And what we then did was we got anybody who had an idea uh, were put into that category and they were sent off to discuss them and prioritize them based on cost and time. But what we also did, anything that was related to a product, we sent through, we have a research and development team who, and they categorize elements for research and development. So it was kind of that transition between an innovative idea for a product or a tool. We sent some of that stuff to the research and development guys and they, they worked through it. So it was just a matter of distilling it down. We came up with five topics 
and we put people into each of the five and some of them have some of them fell out and didn't happen and some are short term that we we're able to turn in really quickly that's really interesting because when i give you my little talk i have a little four box quadrant from kai and kippendorf on adaptive leadership and problem solving and he talks about and that prioritization and winning moves is up in that category that is yeah. you know really easy to do but also really, really high impact. But the crazy ideas section, this is my favorite bit, is really hard to do, really high impact. But that's yeah, the yeah. stuff, as I said, that's the stuff that changes the world. That's, you know, and so when do you go in on something like that or how far can you progress it? Because as you're right, Alan, and, and we have this in Siemens too, we build mission critical stuff that cannot fail, you know, like large infrastructure, whether it's train networks or wind turbines and, and automation and all of that, these things can't fail. But where do you get to the point where then you can do something really crazy and brave? Now, I'm conscious that I haven't, Philip, from a from a, an EIIT perspective and having heard the kind of businesses um, here today, like how are, how do you view the kind of skills that we've been talking about, or those perspectives on innovation, and how are they being addressed within EIIT? I know you talked quite a bit earlier on, and um, casting back to to the importance of you know access to market and access to finance, but critically in all of that, there was an education piece on skills. Yes, thanks. I, I will lower my hand, so I was not clear whether that was was uh, uh, recognized as a. As I a, can't see any hands. <laughs> Sorry. A, yeah, you have a button here at the bottom. And you see a hand going up. Anyway, uh, so I um, I mean I wanted to follow up on this uh, question of uh, transversal skills, and I also pick it up on the chat where uh, one of the. Uh, uh, participants asked the question, how do we differentiate between innovation and R&D? And I think that is an important uh, element. So uh, as, uh, as you rightly said, we do a lot of entrepreneurial education as well. And when I welcome the students uh, to our master school, I always like uh, to have a short discussion with them on what's the difference between a discovery and invention and an innovation. And that also shows a little bit which skills are needed where. And you see that very often innovation and discovery or invention are, are mixed up. And when people think about innovation, they think this is all about creativity. And that's also why you hear it uh, popping up uh, a lot here. Uh, my position is that Invention requires creativity. Innovation, my definition of innovation is bring technical solutions. We're in deep tech, digital, but okay, that may be in general, but in our case, it's about bringing technical solutions to the market. And for that, you need different skills. You need skills of being a connector, you, be, you need skills of being really un, able to understand what are the real needs that your customer has. And that doesn't always mean that is the needs that the customer is expressing, but you should, of course, be able to analyze and really uh, find out what are now the core, core needs. So I would say creativity, absolutely great. I'm a mathematician by training and I love creativity uh, as a result of that. However, innovation is far less about invention and much more about making sure that these great inventions really hit the market and really have impact for your business. And, and when you look from that perspective, then the other aspects of, of uh, being a connector for me are, are much more important. And that's also where our education program, and we have these so-called T-shaped education programs where the transversal skills are really about these uh, skills and far less about uh, creativity because that's more connected to the invention part of the story. That's my contribution. That's, Thank you. That's brilliant, actually. And it, it strikes me, it's been a really, I've written it down for myself. I will be probably be referring to you again because someone's actually after putting it up in the Q&A, well, in the chat, actually. And there was, you know, what is the difference between R&D and innovation? And I think you've kind of 
clarify that a little bit there, but it was a question from Jerry Byrne. How do we differentiate between innovation and R&D? If anyone else wants to answer it, I'm happy to, but Jerry, if you're still on the line and you want to confirm whether or not you feel that you've gotten the answer, um, or if anyone else wants to provide in clarification, just, just let me know. One, uh, Grace Ann Fallon has written in and said she was delighted to hear transversal skills being talked about because she feels it's not widely understood. Um, actually, that, I'm going to bring that question back to John again, just in terms of it being widely understood. Not talking about the technology now, but particularly recruiters. Um, do you feel there is a disproportionate or a proportionate requirement from the market for transversal skills or are people still quite wedded to domain expertise? Well, unfortunately, it's still um, you know, heavily focused on domain expertise. Um, but I think um, over the last couple of years, we've seen a major shift uh, from every arena within large corporations to even those new software tools that companies are building because they are really embedding diversity, for example, as being one of the PCs. So, so they are progressing um, slowly but surely towards a more, I guess, elaborate uh, vision of recruiting without a CV. Because at the end of the day, it's all about people skills. And in order for companies to move towards that, they need to be assisted by the right technology and the right leaders to uh, bring that forward. And unfortunately, there's a, I mean, a lot of the companies are very kind of old fashioned. And yes, they want the creativity and the problem solving, but they still want the certain degree or certain expertise and they like maybe that um, an aspiration that people may have to move into something different. So they want to bundled in a certain way. Matt, um, I'm going to, bring that question to you and then I'm going to go to, to Marcus actually. Um, but Matt, from your perspective then, as, as the probably the most startup-y startup around the group at the moment, um, how do you find, what is the challenge for you in getting people to work for a startup? I mean, you've got the one big advantage in the sense that um, it's a problem that a lot of people can actively understand. So it's easy to win that passion and interest on the project, but how do you find it is trying to recruit somebody to come and work in a startup? Uh, I, I think it's, it's, it's that it's, it's trying to, part of the problem is trying to get that passion, first of all, and that's kind of the key thing that we look for, because you, you need that in a small team, you need that passion to want to work on a potentially global problem. And um, really, sort of, we look initially for that, and then look at how, you know, they can um, they can contribute to it. But we also, like, it's my previous point. You always try and hire someone better than you, or thinks differently to you, because if, you know it's and that sort of and it's something that I'd realized that though why I wanted to start a startup was I did my work placement in a startup of three people, yeah, and I'd found I learned far more in that environment. Than I would have done working in a larger company, and it's just it's it's getting that exposure to all aspects of that sort of a company is is kind of what's really appealing to a lot of people, I think. And that's um, it's funny. I was reading something recently, uh, watching a reading something recently. Who am I kidding? I was watching a video on YouTube that I was sent <laughs> via LinkedIn on uh, from Simon Sinek and he was talking about just cause and you know binding people to this mission or vision and don't get caught up on which it is but just what is that really strong sense of purpose that you have and I worked for a very small tiny little nonprofit for eight years and it's really easy to be emotionally connected to what you're doing in that in that way and then you work for a large large company like like Siemens and it's trying to it's always I love working there because I can see the stuff that we do can actually change the world but you have to find that way of being emotionally connected to what you're doing and whether that is through you know the the, the work that Louis's company is doing and, and the, so many ways of applying that 
um, across so many different industries, um, but also the work that you know that Alan is doing from a communications point of view. Like somebody rang me at the start of last year at the start of COVID, and he said, "Joan, who'd have thought the work you did in the IA was so important? So many people shopping online now, or or communicating with people, and the, the, their knowledge of how secure those payments are." of how secure their communications are. That's really important. So everything that your guys does, that everybody in your team, the technology you're developing is really important. And that level of accessibility is as important for your users as the kind of accessibility that Matt is talking about for his. So I think all of that is, again, really compelling. And I think being able to do it within an SME allows you to have that connection to that essence, to that just cause that sometimes is harder to do in a large multinational. I'm very, very blessed that I get to do it in mine. So um, Marcus, I'm, I'm very conscious of time, but actually I have a question for you in that sense. Obviously you're there in the university running these programs for these students. And we've, uh, my, my experience since 2009, 2010 is addressing the skills shortage. And we have focused very heavily on the skills shortage around STEM. How have curriculum or curricula um, evolved over the last 10 years to reflect the need for STEM, but also balancing that with the commercial skills and the transversal skills that students need? Because brilliant to get somebody coming out of university who is the best engineer you've ever met and um i i'm very impressed that whoever oh and you didn't your connection didn't go down when you mentioned the graduate you got from trinity and not from maneuth i was delighted to see that we didn't cut you off at that point but you know brilliant to have great engineers brilliant scientists but that they can understand the commercial reality and make those connections too so how is that evolving in the university and and preparing graduates for the world of work. Sure, and that's that's a difficult question. Like, kind of, if you would know exactly the balance in these curriculas, that would be really kind of. Uh, it's a constant struggle between kind of foundation, um, a domain-specific knowledge, technical knowledge, which I also believe we need. So, for example, you mentioned security before. Without technical knowledge, we can't solve this. So we need technical knowledge. But on the other side, and also I think the curriculas and the programs in the universities evolved over over time to become more interdisciplinary. So we have different modules, also the wider aspects. For example, ethics in IT is an important topic. Uh, 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 responsible software engineering is an important topic around this. So curriculars programs have evolved into the interdisciplinary wider uh, aspects. Uh, but I also think more on the practical side. So many programs have now an, an internship, a placement, uh, a mandatory replacement uh, in, in the curricula, also practical oriented uh, projects. Uh, so these kind of research projects, which we had maybe a while ago, so they also moved more into addressing impactful uh, research. So I think there's a lot of movement over the last couple of years to get that balance, that mix, right, what we just discussing here. And overall, I fully believe this kind of mix helps then on the end, uh, companies, SMEs around uh, this particular also in Ireland to, to address the skills shortage and to have access to their talents. Because to me, it's actually like one of the really important thing is access to the right talents and mixing the team, collaborating that in that. So on the one side, creativity, on the other side, technical challenges. And, and all of this mix is very important for a team and to advance um, uh, the, uh, the company or the practical side. And I think that's it's true in terms of what the curriculum can do. And then for the students as well, to value the subjects that aren't that aren't in their mind their core subject, because of course, our, you know, we all gravitate to what towards. Even if I, I did a commerce degree, so you imagine very fairly broad, but I focused all my efforts on macroeconomics and marketing because I loved those. And under pain of death, I had to do accounting. And, you know, so I put all my effort into the ones I really liked or the ones where I thought, well, no, no, this is where I'm going to specialize in. So this is where my career is going to be. And so I don't need to do that one that much. And, um, and, and you saw it across all disciplines. The accountants barely showed up for a marketing lecture and they did those projects. But under, you know, their idea of this, this is nonsense, this is silly stuff, it's a waste of time. Students need to be really aware if you're studying the STEM subjects that when you go to work, work we are looking for that stuff as well 
And we really, really need you to understand the balance. And that's the accounting and the marketing and the understanding of a customer and putting yourself in the customer's shoes. I mean, asking uh, a STEM subject person, an engineer, to think about customer journey and user experience. I mean, that's everything that, that Matt is talking about from an access and accessibility point of view. It's what is the customer's experience? What is their journey? We're building technology for that. Now, Enda, you're benefiting by the fact that your trees aren't walking and talking, but you know, understanding the mindset of those users that are the farmers and that are the forestry owners versus the others who are you know, the, the large multinationals and actually striking that balance. All of that is a user experience. So I am conscious of time. It is half past five. How am I doing? Um, oh, look at that. It's exactly <laughs> half past five where I hand over to Marcus. We'll find to that. Gentlemen, you are the most punctual crew I have ever, ever facilitated or moderated. I think there's very little facilitating required on my part or moderation for that matter. So you're all um, fantastic. And I really do appreciate all your contributions. But um, last word goes to Marcus. And just for my part on my semi last word, thank you all so much and the IBI for having me again. Marcus, over to you. Thanks, John. And I won't, um, like, I, I will look that I'm very, very short sure because, like, I really, uh, we wanted to finish at 5.30 Irish time uh, around this. But also, like, I think we, um, like, at the moment with COVID and the pandemic, there's a lot of kind of challenges. But also what I think this webinar showed is a lot of opportunities and a lot of exciting uh, initiatives, what we can set out uh, to do with digital, digital transformation, uh, technology, but also like uh, uh, all the, the creativity and all this. So I think there is a lot in the next couple of months, time to come around opportunities around this. And also like, I think what what we learned over the last couple of months with COVID is the engagement changed, maybe collaboration opportunities increased. So uh, thinking about this panel, what we had now with speakers in a physical world, if you have physical webinar, uh, web, uh, uh, meetings will be difficult. So I think actually also COVID and online engagement helped to actually connect with many, many people um, and uh, share information. So I found that really exciting, motivating also so uh, this, this afternoon, this one and a half hours, two hours of presentation discussion. Um, and, and also I think uh, digital transformation, digital journeys can be exciting, can be very beneficial uh, uh, for companies, but also customers and so on. But it's also, it's, it's a process, it's a journey ongoing. So it's not just a project. Um, and I think also uh, there's lots of support uh, and, and discussions. And I think the key is the mix with talent, skills, and collaboration. So no one can solve all of these problems completely alone. So I think this is a really important part to innovate, to transform digital transformation. So collaboration, and that can help uh, accelerate it. So and I'm, I'm be almost finished, but um, I, I just want to thank everyone, uh, uh, that the speakers particular, uh, Joan, for facilitating um, uh, the, the afternoon. So really appreciate from all the, 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 the contribution, discussions, uh, insights in, in the work. And I also wanted to uh, thank uh, Joe O'Carroll uh, for merits um, uh, uh, on the, the collaboration with this. This is a really good example of how we collaborate, how we Bring companies and also from the university, from IBI together. Uh, so also really appreciate and also like basically the link with the, on the beginning, I showed that uh, wider ecosystem, the partner network. So for example, also Lero and Adapt as research centers, uh, which support these, these type of events. So I think in Ireland, we have a really good network uh, collaboration and a support mechanism for SMEs and companies. So, and now I stop. Thanks Martin. very much for everyone. Thank you so much. And just before anyone hangs up, we've still got 42 people alive. Please note for your diaries, the 4th of March for our next in the webinar series, where um, hopefully the guys will have me back because I am dying to talk about digital retail and the online customer experience, speaking of user experience and security. So yes, digital retail and the online customer experience on the 4th of March. You can find all the details on ivi.ie and make sure you follow them on Twitter there as well. So um, at IVI Insights and LinkedIn. So um, 
that is us for, us all for the day. Thank you all so much again. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Bye now.